Time of blessings, everyone. Um, in case you weren't here last night, I'll be taking the studies today because uh, Brother Gideon's resting his voice. Um, yeah, so I hope we've all had a good week, and here we are once again on the Sabbath day. So before we go into study, as usual, let's um, get on our knees and pray. Lift holy hands. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us all together today on this Sabbath day once again. I pray, Father, that you bless our understanding as we go into your word this day. I pray, Father, that you bridle my tongue and any tongue that shall speak on your behalf. I pray, Father, that you help us to see our great need for you that much more. And that we may strive to get closer to the perfection that is in Jesus. And every single day we may get closer and closer to you. We pray, Father, for all, the, all of those that are on our prayer list, that you bless them, especially those that are lost. And we pray for a strong hedge of angels around all of us and around those who are out there doing the work. And we pray, Father, that you put the burden of the work more heavy upon our hearts, that we may go forward with love, sharing this truth to our fellow uh, people out there, Father. Please give us that same love that Jesus has for us. And we uplift and pray this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Ah. Okay, so, so there'll be two, I'll, yeah, I'll go into two studies today, and first of all, we'll be looking back in the sanctuary and going into the altar of incense, which of course we looked at before, but I still got some, there's still a bit more to go in this study, perhaps two parts. Um, I think we've done like Three or four already. Um, so just to recap on this um, particular point, we saw before that the altar of incense was placed in the earthly sanctuary just before the veil um, of between the holy place and the most holy place. So here it is there. And of course, the priest every morning would um, come in with the censer and would burn incense, right? Sweet incense that would go up towards uh heaven well it would be symbolic of that and of course we knew we found out how this was all symbolic of christ right because the high priest represented jesus who is our high priest and how currently right now as we speak um when we pray christ is before the throne in heaven and he is ascending our prayers before the father right um as we see in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 to 4, because, of course, John, he saw the heavenly temple and he saw Christ as high priest standing in front of the altar of burnt incense in, in the heavenly temple. And we saw this quote from Sister White where, you know, this picture depicts it quite well, where it's like we're praying and we look up and Christ is there in the heavenly sanctuary in New, Jer in New Jerusalem, ascending our prayers before the Father, essentially. Um, and as we see here, Jesus is our saviour today. He is pleading for us in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and he will forgive our sins. Cool. So that was just a little recap. Da, da, da. Me. Slideshow. Can't slide. Cool. So in Psalms chapter 141, verse 2, we read, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 27, we see, Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard 
and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. And hence what I've got in the background there, some of you may notice again, the, you know, Orion's belt. Because if you look into, you know, if you go into a deep study on that, you will find out that the city of New Jerusalem, heaven, where our, where Jesus currently is right now, as our high priest, is located somewhere in this area, underneath Orion's belt, I believe it is, in the, in the nebula, which Sister White spoke about. Uh -huh. So, going on, we see here in Gospel Workers, page 428, paragraph 2, Sister White writes about Martin Luther, and she says that Luther was a man of prayer. He worked and prayed as though something must be done, and that at once, and it was done. So essentially, he prayed, he believed that prayer would be answered, and then he went to work on that prayer. Right? His prayers were followed up by venturing something on the promises of God, and through divine aid he was enabled to shake the vast power of Rome, my bad. So that in every country the foundation of the papacy trembled. Then in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 168, paragraph 2, we read, From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world in the Great Reformation. There, with holy calmness, the servants of the Lord set their feet upon the rock of his promises. During the struggle at Augsburg, Luther did not fail to devote three hours each day to prayer, and these were taken from that portion of the day most favorable to study. So if you guys will remember from when we were reading SOP4 on the Friday nights, what happened at Augsburg was when you had the protest of the, the German princes who were standing up for the Bible, essentially, in front of the emperor of Germany, of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, who was standing for the Pope. And Luther wasn't allowed to pretend there, but during that time, he would devote three hours each day to prayer during that struggle. And of course, God heard those prayers. And at that protest of the princes, um, that's where you get the word Protestant from, because they protested against the emperor's decree, which was basically stopping them from having, uh, from practicing their faith freely in Germany. Oh, well, all over Europe but particularly at that time in Germany. So we see that it was from the secret place of prayer that came that power that shook the world in the Great Reformation. And of course, we know there is an even greater reformation just upon us in our day. And so in the same way those servants of God prayed in times past, we need to ha get to that point of faith where we have that prevailing prayer, where God will answer us and God will work for us, essentially. In 1 Peter 4, 7, it says, The end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And in Gospel Workers, page 427, paragraph 5, Sister White says, Our brethren do not wrestle all night in prayer as many godly men before us have done. They sit up bent over tables, writing lessons or preparing articles to be read by thousands. They arrange facts in shape to convince the mind in regard to doctrine. All these things are essential. But how much can God do for us in sending light and power to convict hearts in answer to the prayer of faith? So all that other stuff is essential, right? Nothing wrong with that at all. I and mean, we, we have to be doing all of that. We have to be doing the work of the Lord. But remember what we read last night about how in the midnight cry, and of course it will be the same in the loud cry, it's not going to be argument that can that convicts people of the truth. It's going to be the power of God. But for us to have that power of God attending us, you know, we need to be much in prayer, as Sister White writes here. You know, we need to realize that God can do much for us when we pray and are fervent in prayer. We wrestle as did Jacob. And in James 5.16, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not availeth 
a little or availeth somewhat, availeth much. And this I remember because back, you know, a couple uh, over two years ago now, when I was in a very bad state, and I remember sending a prayer requests to Pastor Nicholas because I remembered this verse in particular. I was like, I know the Lord is going to hear his prayer, you know. And then eventually I started praying as well for the healing and getting my act together. And then the Lord healed me of a medically incurable bowel disease, of the internal bleeding that I had. Um, so, yeah, when we pray, our prayers will avail much. And also remind well i was also reminded because back when i was like 18 and my dad was in hospital and it looked like he wasn't going to get out of that hospital because he was so unwell and i remember sending a prayer request to pastor nicholas which he sent to the church family and within a month it went from you know the doctor kind of almost you know when they kind of try and like prepare you for the worst kind of thing like, oh, yeah, they could die kind of thing. But they say it in a, they don't say it like that kind of thing. Yeah, he went from that within a month. He was out of that hospital. Um, and of course, we see many and heard many of these kind of miracles that the Lord does for his people. Uh, the healing miracles and all of that. So in Exodus chapter 29, verses 38 to 40, it says, Now... This is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of an hin of beaten oil, and the fourth part of an hin of wine for a drink offering. So in the Jewish economy, in the Old Testament, we see that the, the two lambs were sacrificed every single day continually one in the morning one in the evening and of course because christ every single day as our high priest up in that heavenly sanctuary is pleading our case and his blood before the father we saw that quote before where he literally pleaded before the father my blood my blood in hebrews seven twenty five, it says wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. In Luke chapter 1 verse 10 we see, um, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. That was in the morning. So uh, to give some context, that was when Zachar, yeah, John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, he was one of the priests and he went into the temple in the morning time at the time of incense. and. So outside the temple, in the courtyard, all the people would be gathered um, at the time of incense, right, in the morning. And in Daniel 6.10, we see now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And and this was after um, remember this was when they were getting him thrown in the lion's den, right? That's why it says when Daniel knew the writing was signed. So this was after he knew that, yeah, okay, if I pray, they're gonna throw me in the den of lions. And he's like, okay, I mean, we know Daniel didn't care. He's gonna get on his knees and pray to his Lord anyway. And why toward Jerusalem? Well, because of course he was in Babylon at the time. The temple was destroyed. But they would still pray, he would still pray towards Mount Moriah, which of course, Mount Moriah is where the temple was situated. And of course, on Mount Moriah, there was a like an actual stone, like a like a like a rock where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, if you remember from previous studies. And then later on, that was also where David made a, a, a sacrifice. Um, in Second Samuel chapter 23, if I remember correctly, 23 or 24, one of those chapters. So David made a sacrifice on that altar where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. It was the place where, um, if you remember, David, he bought it from a guy called, uh, from a Jebusite, Ornan the Jebusite, that's the one. 
And then Solomon ended up building the temple there with, on the land that David bought on Mount Moriah. And the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was situated, they believed that that was situated right on top of the, the altar where Abraham would have went to sacrifice Isaac. But of course, he didn't sacrifice Isaac. He sacrificed the ram, which, if you remember, had its horns caught in the thicket bush or a thorn bush. Why the thorn bush? Well, because the ram represents, of course, Christ, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what happened when he came to earth? They put a crown of thorns on his head. So when we do this and when we pray, as did Daniel, at least three times a day on our knees, in Deuteronomy 33, 25, it says, Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And in Steps to Christ, page 114, verse 1, Sister White says, Pray in your closet, and as you go about your daily labor, let your heart be often uplifted to God. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. These silent prayers rise like precious incense before the throne of grace. Satan cannot overcome him whose heart is thus stayed upon God. Going on, she says, there is no time or place in which it is inappropriate to offer up a petition to God. There is nothing that can prevent us from lifting up our hearts in the spirit of earnest prayer. In the crowds of the street, in the midst of a business engagement, we may send up a petition to God and plead for divine guidance, as did Nehemiah when he made his request before King Artaxerxes. A closet of communion may be found wherever we are. We should have the door of the heart open continually and our invitation going up that Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in the soul. And I'm sure most of you do this, including myself. You know, it's like, because that's why Paul says pray without ceasing. Because although, yeah, three times a day, morning, evening and night, you'll get on your knees and pray, right? At least three times. Whenever you can, you find the opportunity to pray. Or I like I like to go on a walk in nature and just talk to the Father about, I just kind of, you know, a lot, of, most, a lot of the time I just pour everything out that I have to say to him. So, in, in page 117, paragraph 2 of Steps to Christ, Sister White says, The life must be like Christ's. Like Christ's life. Between the mountain and the multitude. Why the mountain and the multitude? Because the mountain, if you read in the Gospels, was where Christ liked to go to pray, like the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And the multitude, of course, that's because we got to do the work and we got to go and share the truth with the people, right? So, and that's, you know, because if you spent your whole time in the mountain, so to speak, the whole time praying, well, Eventually, your prayers are just going to become vain repetitions, right? Or it's just going to become some selfish. But you know, like those Buddhists that they go to the mountains and they just meditate and pray or whatever they do for just days and days and days and days on end, those monks, right? And I think in Rome, the Catholic monks do a similar thing. It's like you can't do any good if you're just always praying the whole time, right? And it's, it's in when we go forth and do the work, well, that's going to give you your material for when you pray, right? So when you're going, even when you're going about your daily life, because you're going to pray for your family members or your work colleagues. And then, of course, our brothers and sisters in Christ and all the prayers we have on our hearts and minds, right? Whether that be, you know, spoken prayer requests or even unspoken. So when we go into our prayer closet, we can remember our brothers and sisters in Christ and pray for each of us, you know, individually. We will pray for each other on our own individual needs and what have you. Um, and as many of you see, when you're in prayer, the Father will even bring up topics, like he'll bring up names sometimes, and, and you, you'll put in your memory things that certain people are going through, so you can pray for them. Because imagine this, you don't know that you, you could be the only person, the only Christian that God hears their prayers, who is praying for that person. And it's in God hearing your prayers and answering your prayers that that person is maybe, you know, is kept healthy, kept living, 
check from disaster. Right? Um, so yeah. And then of course when you go out and do the work, you meet so many different people. You get their names and that's given you material to pray about. So in Joel 2, chapter 17 to 18, we see a similar thing here. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. So, in the same way where we see the mountain and the multitude, we see here the porch and the altar. Of course, we have the altar of burnt incense in the temple or the sanctuary where the prayers are being ascended as the sweet incense. And the porch, as we see here in Solomon's temple, because that's at the time when Joel was writing, there would have been Solomon's temple. The porch is, would be this area here. Um, and of course, the people would congregate here, right, which in the old a tabernacle is known as the courtyard, which represents, of course, the earth. So essentially, when we pray, it's like we're standing between the people and God. And then, of course, we have Christ standing between the Father and us, who's ascending that, those prayers to him. You know, so we have to do that work of Christ and of pleading for those around us, right? those who are on this planet, Especially those ones that are lost, that God sends our way. But prayerfully, God will convict them and they will repent and they will be saved by Christ. And here we see the example of our Saviour himself when it came to pray, prayer. Now, there's many different examples I could have chosen. If you read Spirit of Prophecy, Volumes 2 and 3, you will see that... Um, our Lord and Saviour Jesus was a man of prayer like no other. Um, but I took this one from Gospel Workers, page 106, paragraph 4. She says, The Majesty of Heaven, while engaged in his earthly ministry, prayed much to his Father. He was frequently bowed all night in prayer. His spirit was often sorrowful as he felt the powers of the darkness of this world and he left the busy city and the noisy throng to seek a retired place to make his intercessions. The Mount of Olives was the favourite resort of the Son of God for his devotions. Frequently, after the multitude had left him for the retirement of the night, he rested not, though weary with the labours of the day. In the Gospel of John we read, And every man went unto his own house. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And that's John 7, 53, 8, 1. So, you know, Jesus would have a long day. He's been doing the work. He's been healing all these people and he's preaching the truth. He must be tired. But everyone goes to their house. Christ goes to pray all night long. While the city was hushed in silence and the disciples had returned to their homes to obtain refreshment and sleep, Jesus slept not. His divine pleadings were ascending to his father from the Mount of Olives, that his disciples might be kept from the evil influences which they daily encounter in the world, and that his own soul might be strengthened and braced for the duties and trials of the coming day. All night, while his followers were sleeping, was their divine teacher praying. The dew and frost of night fell upon his head, bowed in prayer. His example is left for his followers. So if Christ felt the need to pray so fervently and at such length pleading to his father these things, how much more do we need to have this attain to this sort of faith? Because Jesus was one who could raise the dead back to, you know, from death to life. Yet he himself spent much time in prayer. In Leviticus 16.13 it says, And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. So 
this would have been when Leviticus 16 is the Day of Atonement. And this is when the priest, the high priest representing Christ, went into the most holy place. And the incense would cover the mercy seat so that he wouldn't die. And in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, we read, I will rejoice. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So, you know, it's our faith in Christ, and by his precious blood, we are covered with the robe of his righteousness, and now we can stand in the presence of God and have our prayers heard and answered by him. Whereas, of course, before we received that blood of Jesus and, you know, we were under his, we were under the law, as we learned last week, you know, and, and the penalty of that law, which is death. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. And notice, it's not the wages of sin is eternal life burning in the flames of hell. No, it's the wages of sin is death. Period. Full stop. Eternal death. That hellfire puts you out of existence. Turns you into ashes. Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. So, in Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of saints. So we see here that not only Christ the high priest has the, the incense ascending before the Father, but also the 24 elders that are, that are up there right now in New Jerusalem. Because of course we know, although everyone who's died is in the grave, including David, right? So David isn't in heaven right now, in case you didn't know that. He's in the grave, sleeping. He's dead. He's not in heaven. However, the 24 elders those that were resurrected with Christ after, yeah, you know, when he rose from the dead, they're in heaven. And so too is Elijah and Enoch, because if you read about them, they never died. They were translated to heaven. And so too is um, Moses, because shortly after Moses died, he was resurrected from the dead and taken to heaven. You can read about that in Jude. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, we see, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the altar of burnt incense, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season unto their until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Why did I put this verse in here? Because we see that these are obviously talking about the Christians that we know died in the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation that took place between 538 AD and 1798 AD. When the Roman Catholic Church murdered over 100 million Bible believing Christians. And so, of course, they were praying and Revelation, you know, John pens this, how they would be, they were praying at this time, you know, don't you, Father, like, do you, will you avenge our blood? And, it, and it, it's been a long, long time, right? But this is a case of the Father has heard that their prayer is lodged in that altar, right? It's made it there. But, and their prayer will be answered, of course. Revelation 92, 19 two. for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So we know God is going to avenge them. He just hasn't done it yet. Right. But their prayer made it to the altar. John even saw it in vision. And that's like with many of our prayers, some of our prayers, it Maybe we pray something and it doesn't get answered instantly, but it doesn't mean that the prayer didn't make it to the altar. It's just going to take time for God to answer it. Right? Either because he needs to test us or try us or 
sometimes we can't know. Sometimes it's just, all right, God, this in your hands. And I'm just going to trust you, which, of course, which I believe must have been the thought of many of those people as they were about to be torn apart by lions or burnt alive at the stake, or used as human torches in the streets of Rome. And they just trusted in his providence that this was for his glory that they were to die. And of course, they rejoiced at the fact that they were counted worthy to die for him and to suffer as Christ suffered. Who, of course, suffered more than any of us could ever suffer. In Exodus chapter, wait, do I want to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 37 to 38, it says, And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, you shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell thereto, shall even be cut off from his people. So essentially, talking about, if you remember, we were talking about how there were certain like spices that went into making the incense um, when, you know, that the priest would use in, in the, for the altar of incense. Um, so even if you were to make anything like it, similar to it, that person was to be cut off from his people. And in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, we see this story of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons. So he says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. So, we see here, Aaron's sons, they offered strange fire, which the Lord commanded not, and they were killed for doing so. So it's very serious when God tells us to do something and we do something which he doesn't command us to do, which we think he will accept. And of course, we're given the reason why they done this. It was because they were drunk. That's why the Bible tells us to be sober, because when you're under the influence of narcotics like alcohol, your, your reverence for things that are holy goes out the window. Isaiah 64, 6, we read, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So, yeah, if we try and gain salvation by our own righteousness, by our own works, right, which is what the Roman Catholic Church tries to teach, we will always fall short because our righteousness that we do in our own flesh without christ are as filthy rags in the eyes of god because we're all filthy sinners and in isaiah 61 10 it says i will greatly rejoice in the lord my soul shall be joyful in my god for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels 
So Christ, when we have that faith in Jesus, his righteousness is imputed unto us. Then God doesn't see us anymore as the filthy sinner we are, but he sees Jesus. How amazing is that? And then, of course, we will do the works of Christ rather than doing our own what we think is right. Like Nadab and Abihu going and offering the incense which God commanded them not. And of course, in Ephesians 2 8, we see, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Just, uh, okay, finish this. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, right, where we read about them offering the strange fire and they got burnt up, well, that reminds me of what the Roman Catholic Church and all the false churches are going to do in our day with the Sunday law, with their false Sabbath. Their Sunday Sabbath is strange fire. The law didn't command it. God said, create, uh, create, keep the seventh day holy, right? That's what he commanded. But they throw it out the window and just say, oh, no, we'll, we'll keep Sunday holy. Why? Because like Nadab and Abihu, they're drunk. On false doctrine in this case, you know, well, some of those priests, they drink alcohol too. But yeah, they're all drunk on false doctrine. They're all drunk on that. So they go and make up their own idol. They offer strange fire. And because of that, because of that they will literally be burnt up at the second coming of Christ. As Nadab and Abihu were burnt up. You know, so we have to always remember that whatever God tells us, we have to keep that thing and not try and do our own thing which we think is right because the human heart is deceitful above all things it says in proverbs you know we can't think that our way is the way to go no god's way is the way to go and let's not question that right because some might say oh why the seventh day oh, i want to keep wednesday holy you know or, well in most cases it's sunday right <laughs> but god said the seventh day because that's the day he rested he actually did give a reason for it actually in that case um, but you know, some people they say they can worship on any day. There was one Christian lady who I was speaking to this week when I was out, you know, doing the knocking on doors, and she and I, I pray that she got convicted about the Sabbath because I went through Hebrews four four to eleven with her. We had quite a long conversation, but what she was saying was that thing of like, well, why can't we just worship on any day? And I was gonna bring, I was thinking of bringing up Nadab and Abihu, but I was like, oh, maybe she hasn't read it. Or she doesn't know about that so i just made the example which i think i heard from pastor nicholas about you know in the garden of Eden, adam and eve they were told not to eat of, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil right god told them specifically don't eat from that tree that was the commandment so it's not like then adam and eve could go oh yeah but you know we're actually going to pick this tree not to eat from we'll eat from that tree right but we'll pick this tree we will we'll, we'll, we decide not to eat from that one and that's what people are doing when they choose to reject God's seventh day Sabbath and choose another day of the week of their choosing, which isn't in the Bible. Um, okay. All right, well, we'll finish this. In Numbers 16, 46 to 48, we see this is when um, Korah was rebelling against, you know, Moses. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed and in number 16 3 and 35 we see and they gathered themselves together this is talking about Korah and his host against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them ye take too much upon you seeing all the congregation are holy every one of them and the Lord is among them wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord and there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense Again, because they were they weren't offering up the Lord's incense or they weren't doing it in the character. Of them. They weren't supposed to be doing it anyway. They weren't even of that. Uh, they, you know, they weren't of the, the Levitical priesthood. 
uh, or they weren't of the of Aaron's family to do that. I, I remember, yeah, they were Levites, but they weren't um, of descendants of Aaron. They weren't of Aaron's family, so they couldn't do that. And they wanted to, and they done it, and then God destroyed them for it. Um, and then, of course, later on in the same chapter, some of the people get a plague, and then Aaron puts on incense, which, as it says here, the plague was stayed because he stood between the dead and the living. And actually, that's how we all have to be as Christians, right? Um, we stand literally between the dead and the living. All of us here who are in Christ, in God's eyes, we're the living, right? Who are the dead? Pretty much 99.999% of the people out there. And we have to go out there and give the message to them, the message of truth, um, which would hopefully lead them to eternal life. So in Testament to the Church, volume 5, page 174, verse 1, Sister White says, If we are following Christ, his merits imputed to us come up before the Father as sweet odor, and the graces of our Savior's character implanted in our hearts will shed around us a precious fragrance. The spirit of love, meekness, and forbearance pervading our life will have power to soften and subdue hard hearts and win to Christ bitter opposers of the faith. Of course, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And so just to recap on the whole altar, altar of incense study, we see that a golden altar was before the veil in Exodus chapter 30. And in Revelation chapter 8, we see that the golden altar was seen in heaven before the throne of God. We also see in Exodus 30 that incense was burned on the golden altar by the high priest every morning and evening. And in Revelation chapter 8, we see much incense is added to the prayers of all saints and they ascend before God. We also see in Exodus and Leviticus, the one who should burn incense with strange fire was to be destroyed. And in Isaiah 64, 6, we see one clothed with his own righteousness will be destroyed. Cool. So that's the end of that study. Okay. So we're going to close out the service there with prayer. So because I, um, cause I was finishing, I thought we might as well finish that study today rather than, you know, yeah, so because I was going to do another one, but I will do that one hopefully next week. And yeah, because that went a bit over. So we will uh, get on our knees and pray and close out and bow our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that Christ stands on our behalf for us, pleading his blood before your throne and ascending our prayers and petitions before you, even this day. And so we pray, Father, for more faith, more courage to share the truth, more of that love of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you help us to, to pray more fervently you know, and to, to truly believe that the things we pray will come to pass. And we pray, Father, for the latter rain. We pray, Father, that we will go forward and do those miracles which Christ himself done when he walked among us. And we pray, Father, once again for all our loved ones who are lost, that you save them, Father. And we pray for, we pray that you would help us to find those lost sheep of Israel that are out there, that you put them in our path, in our wherever we go when we're sharing the truth, so that we can bring the truth to their hearts, that they will repent and be saved. And we pray, Father, that you help us to overcome all the sin in our lives and to get closer to that perfection that is in Christ. And I also want to pray, Father, that you will uh, please uh, heal Brother Gideon with the, of his voice. And so that next week he can come back up here and share some truth with us. And we pray this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour and our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.